Today, I've got a quick lesson on how the recent drawdown we've seen could offer some tremendous opportunities in the stock market, especially for growth companies. So let me show you why. I have a Palantir example from my valuation model, but first I wanna show you something else. Let's just use Tesla as the example first. So here I have modeled Tesla's earnings, growing at what I feel is a fairly good base case, consider their current plans for production and the operating leverage that they have demonstrated. So I'm expecting them to more than 20 their earnings through the end of the decade here. As stocks have come under fire, growth companies have been hit the hardest. Oh, you know, well, Tesla should just be reset to $200. There's nothing supporting its valuation up in the $1,000 range. It should just be $200. Well, let me show you something, and then I'll lead it into Palantir. There are two ways of doing this. You can do a price-to-earnings growth method approach, which is saying growth is worth something, or you can just say, I'm just going to flatline the PE Tesla should be worth. So let's say traditional auto makers sell for about 10 price to earnings ratio, but let's actually give Tesla much more of a Apple-like multiple for its undeniable margins and software technologies that makes it much more of an Apple-like company, whereby it could have Apple's multiple. So that's what I'm going off of in the long run. But you see what happens is if Tesla's trading at 110 times, that rapidly compresses all the way down to, let's say, 30 times in 2030. As the growth starts to slow, we get a peg of one there. Price to earnings over that growth rate is one. But you see, Tesla has over one times price to earnings growth for this year. Now, why is that? That's because they're compounding their growth so rapidly that you can't assign a one times price to earnings growth rate. So let's say if Tesla trades at 110 times PE off of $10 billion in earnings for this year, it would be a $957 price. Then down to 90, compress the multiple by 18%, and the stock still grows by 31%. And then we compress the multiple by 33%, the stock grows about 4%. So you see, the multiple compression can still lead to outperformance in the stock. I guess this wouldn't be outperformance, but you get the idea you'll see over time as we go. We compress the multiple by 8%, the stock delivers 28% return. Again, these are just totally hypotheticals, but compress the multiple again by 9%, stock can go up 25%. Compressed by 10, increases by 22. Compressed by 11, increases by 20. Compressed by 13, increases by 14. Compressed by 14, increases by 12. And all of a sudden, we have a 30 times price to earnings multiple. The stock is five times higher. And these seem like fairly okay returns, something that could be possible, right? And that's driven by the fundamental performance of the bottom line, the earnings are growing so rapidly. So the multiple compression can happen and there's still a tremendous increase in the stock price. But I'm gonna give the critics some time now. Let's say, you know, Tesla's only worth 30 times price to earnings, even in the best case, even if they have the best margins in the auto industry, have the best technology. They're doing great on the software side. They haven't rolled out robo taxis, by the way, because this earnings rate that I have forecasted here, I believe, is just my expectations on automotive and then some software and some energy, but nothing in terms of robo taxi or bot. So let's say, you know, best case, maybe Tesla's only worth 30 times its earnings, like Apple. Tesla stock is a $200 stock off of that 30 times priced earnings multiple. If it does grow earnings by 60% next year, when its factories are actually able to open up and the multiple doesn't compress or expand, the stock just went up 50% in one year. That's not supposed to happen. It does happen, it has happened, it can happen to any stock, but stocks aren't supposed to go up or down that much. The market is supposed to be intelligent enough to be able to understand the future and factor in all the elements that it possibly can. Let's say the earnings go up by 56%, the stock does another 50% rise, and then another 47% rise, and then a 36% rise following the earnings growth of the stock, you see? So we end up in 2030 with the same stock price based on that 30 times multiple. You wanna say it's worth 10 times, that doesn't make any sense. You're still getting an outperformance from where we stand today. I think a minimum of 25 is sufficient. You can mess around with the earnings, but that's what I wanted to show you is the effect of the fact that growth of earnings into the future has tangible value on the company. Of course, Tesla and any other company has to execute on that growth, but this is a reason that price to earnings and price to sales 
figures can be high because they compress over time, all right? That is normal. This is not normal for the multiple to not compress and the valuation to increase by significant amounts every year. You see, the price to earnings growth, where you factor in the growth, the earnings multiple is high over time but comes down, is here compared to this crazy trajectory. And this is just for the bears who claim a stock like Tesla should be worth $200 a share. Well, if it did drop that far, then it would be really compounding at an insane rate. Okay, so that's not gonna happen. But now let me show you the same sort of thing with the Palantir idea. This is my Palantir valuation model. I just broke this out as an example. You can download it with a link in the description, palantirvision.com. This is my bear case revenue scenario. I've modeled all of this stuff privately. More updates coming in June. I will push out a new update shortly. So let's say Palantir does 2 billion in revenue in 2022, 15 billion in revenue in 2030. By the way, I really think it's important. I'm gonna keep saying this. Model on your own. If you don't have any understanding of the fundamentals of company you're investing in, you're pretty much in the dark. Right now, Palantir is trading at 11 times price to sales. It went as high as 45 times price to sales. I think it is tremendously oversold. If we give it a 15 times price to sales multiple, which I figure is more reasonable, and this is, by the way, including dilution, which I've modeled in a previous sheet here. We do the multiple off the sales. We get the valuation to the stock price. I still think this is a low multiple, but... We'll take it the way it is. This is a pretty conservative scenario. As I mentioned, this is the bear case for me. Let's say the sales increase 2,500, 3,300, 4,300, 54, you get the idea. And the multiple compresses by, again, this would not happen exactly this way, but by one times every year, we get down to seven times in 2030. Now is seven times reasonable? Well, it's well below Microsoft, which I looked at. I think Microsoft will be probably a fair comp by then. It's well below the industry average of about 12 times sales. So I think Palantir trading for seven times sales is a little bit unrealistic, but I think it is in fairly conservative in terms of what we could be looking at here. And this is, by the way, once again, including some significant dilution, which I don't think is necessarily going to happen. But if Palantir's worth 108 billion in 2030, seven times multiple off that, we get to $32 a share. And here, look, these are fairly reasonable returns every year. 11%, 12%, 13, 8, 13, 12, 12, 12, 11. This is the whole idea of a discount rate. You discount each year in the DCF, you'll find that down here, by about 10% so that you see what the stock should be worth today. And if it's worth a lot less than that, the stock is undervalued and should correct, assuming your estimates and assumptions are correct and proved to be over time. Palantir, even with these conservative estimates, which once again are conservative in my opinion, with such high dilution lowering the share price and some pretty conservative growth as well as a very conservative price to sales. Once again, in my bear case, we see the fairly steady stock gain increase, but with the stock trading at about eight or nine dollars, the stock could be 58% undervalued at this point. That's the point I'm trying to make, but if you say, oh, Palantir's price to sales ratio is ridiculous, it should be trading at seven times sales or even lower than that. Well, let's see what happens when you do that. Palantir's worth $6 a share this year, but then as they increase their growth rate, again, you'll see the growth rate is actually fairly small, for the bear case, of course, being outweighed by the dilution, which is some aggressive dilution. You can go change it yourself and edit your own forecasts, but it doesn't make any sense to have it be a seven times sales and have the growth of the revenue compound so significantly. It leads to some crazy returns year on year. Now, it would be great for us shareholders to have these returns, and I'm not saying Palantir can't trade this way, but I'm telling you, it doesn't make sense. Market drawdowns happen, and they are necessity of markets in general, but I really don't understand the criticism of growth stocks. Of course, not all growth stocks are great. You need to find the ones with high quality revenue. Do your own diligence on every aspect of their business. Make sure they're going to be able to withstand the challenges. Make sure they have great products. So that's what I want to leave you with. Growth companies with high double digit growth rates. There is definite value to that growth. But also, on the other hand, there is risk to that growth not appearing. So it has to be a balance between the two. Is the growth going to happen versus when the growth does happen, this has a big effect and a big impact. So I just wanted to share that with you. Hopefully it was helpful. Leave a like if it was, and I'll catch you in the next video.